Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Preparing for GDPR Compliance, Technology Must-Haves for IT Security and Privacy Practitioners. Before we get started, I'd like to go over a few items so you know how to participate in today's event. You will have the opportunity to submit text questions to, the, to today's presenters by typing your questions into the questions pane of the control panel. You may send in your questions at any time during the presentation. We will collect these and address them during the Q&A session at the end. We will be recording the webinar today, so please sit back, relax, and enjoy the session. I would like now to introduce today's speakers, Sarah Williamson, commercial and technology lawyer at Boyd Turner, and Max Pritchard, pre-sales consultant at Active Reach. Over to you, Sarah. Okay. Hello everybody and welcome to today's webinar. So during this webinar um, I'm going to give you an overview of GDPR and some of the key provisions that are relevant to IT security and privacy practitioners. So first of all I'm going to look at the data protection principles and the lawful basis for processing personal data. From a practical perspective I will talk about accountability and governance and the tools that you need to put into place. Now, the focus of the GDPR is very much on the data subjects and giving them back control of their own data. This means that under the GDPR, data subjects have enhanced rights, and I'll run through these. Another significant change under the GDPR is that processors have direct obligations, and I'll provide a summary of these as well as looking at how GDPR will affect supplier and processor agreements before ending with the much-publicized sanctions and the implications of Brexit. So with limited time, let's get started. Now, GDPR is a regulation and is therefore directly effective in the UK without the need for national implementing legislation. It is in fact in force now and has been since 2016. 25th of May 2018 is the date that it will be applied from and this date will not change. This means that in terms of having a grace period in which to achieve compliance, that's what we're currently in and we only have just over seven months left. GDPR really is a game changer. One of its aims is to address the rapid technological advancements and the unprecedented scale of global flows of personal data, which have given rise to a need to change the way in which data about individuals is sorted, managed, and processed. Another aim of the GDPR is to harmonize European data protection laws and create a one-stop shop for data protection with a common set of rules applying across Europe. It is worth highlighting that there are a number of derogations within the U GDPR, where member states can exercise some discretion, and therefore there won't be complete harmonization across Europe. It's also important to bear in mind that GDPR will affect any organization processing personal data, irrespective of size or sector. In fact, the ICO is warning small and medium-sized businesses to take note, as they have fined an SME £60,000 for failing to take basic steps to protect its website from a cyber attack. So looking first at the data principles, which set out the conditions for processing personal data. It's critical that organizations understand these, as a failure to comply with the principles will mean that your processing is unlawful. Now the good news is that when we look at the six principles set out in the GDPR as shown on the slide, they are broadly the same as those in the current Data Protection Act. The principle of transparency is something that appears throughout the GDPR and so is one to always bear in mind. Also, running across all of the six principles is the significant new addition of an accountability principle, which essentially requires you to demonstrate how you comply with the principles, and it's this that I'm going to look at shortly. So as well as complying with the principles, in order to lawfully process personal data, you need to have a lawful basis to do so. The first of these in the slide is consent, and it's this that has probably attracted the most attention. However, bear in mind that there are five other legal bases as well, including where processing is necessary for the performance of a contract and where it's necessary for the legitimate interests of the controller. It is important to consider which basis is the correct one for your processing activity, as you can't simply change part way through. In particular, given the stricter requirement for consent under GDPR, which requires consent to be freely given, specific, informed, and unambiguous, this might be a difficult basis to use. So as we've seen, GDPR introduces a new accountability principle, 
which means that not only do you need to comply with GDPR, but you also need to be able to demonstrate compliance. So let's have a look at some of the requirements. First of all, privacy by design and by default. Organisations are required to put into place comprehensive but proportionate governance measures to show that they've integrated data compliance measures into their data processing activities from the initial design stages and throughout the life cycle. This is known as privacy by design. Now, privacy by design is not a new concept, but it is now explicitly recognized by GDPR, along with privacy by default. The key is that privacy can no longer be an afterthought, but needs to be embedded into policies, procedures, and systems. So what measures can an organization adopt to achieve privacy by design? Well, training and awareness are important, as is record keeping, which I'll look at shortly. In terms of security measures, GDPR doesn't specify which measures you have to have in place. And there is a risk-based approach taking into account the state of the art and the costs of implementation. Measures such as data minimization and pseudonymization are, however, specifically mentioned in the regulation. Pseudonymized information is a privacy-enhancing technique, but it's important to remember that it is still a form of personal data and does not preclude other data protection measures. Encryption is also a measure that organizations should consider, and the ICO has handed down fines to organizations who have failed to encrypt the personal data that they hold. In terms of privacy by default, this requires controllers to implement appropriate technical and organizational measures to ensure that by default, only personal data which is necessary for each specific purpose of the processing are processed. And there therefore needs to be limits on storage and accessibility of the data. Privacy test settings will certainly be important. Before moving on, I also want to briefly mention codes of conduct and certification. The GDPR states that adherence to an approved code of conduct or an approved certification mechanism may be used as a way to demonstrate compliance with the requirements. Now, we see that the ICO already issues guidance and will continue to do so over the coming months. And over time, we may well see associations preparing codes of conduct and we might also see data protection certification mechanisms and data protection seals. So what else can organizations do to demonstrate compliance? The ICO's guidance around data protection impact assessments talks about them being necessary when organizations introduce new technology to process or store information, whether this is personal data or sensitive personal data, and where there's a risk that this processing might affect an individual's rights and freedoms. For example, where the new technology might make it harder for an individual to enforce their subject access rights. Under GDPR, there is now a requirement to undertake impact assessments when the organization is undertaking a high-risk processing activity. High-risk activities could include large-scale processing of sensitive personal data, referred to under GDPR as special categories of data, and where there's automated profiling activities and systematic monitoring, for example, IT network security monitoring. There is a benefit of these assessments as it allows organizations to identify the risks early and take steps to mitigate them, avoiding later breaches and potential fines. And guidance on impact assessment is available on the ICO's website. So next, breach notification. Organizations need to have processes in place to meet the notification obligations. At the moment, notification of data breaches is optional, although advisable if there's a risk to individuals. Under GDPR, there is a requirement to notify the supervisory authority without undue delay and within 72 hours, unless the controller can demonstrate that the breach is unlikely to result in a high risk to the rights and freedoms of natural persons. Where a breach is likely to be a high risk to the rights and freedoms of individuals, the data subjects concerned must also be notified without undue delay. There are circumstances where notification to the data subject is not necessary including where the organization has implemented protection measures, particularly those that render the personal data unintelligible, such as encryption. Record keeping is a big part of governance and accountability. Organizations will need to keep records of their processing activities and the purposes of the processing. As we can see, reporting requirements differ depending on the size of the organization, with the burden being greater for larger organizations those with 250 or more employees. However, even if you have less than 250 employees but carry out high-risk processing, or the processing is not occasional, then you also need to maintain records. 
Given that the obligation to, keep, to record keep is within the GDPR, and in view of the accountability and uh, transparency principles, I would certainly advise all organisations to undertake record keeping regardless of their size. Data protection officers. Controllers and processors will have to appoint a DPO as part of their accountability programme if their core activities require, require regular or systematic monitoring of data subjects on a large scale, or the large scale processing of sensitive personal data or criminal records. So what does their DPO do? DPO is the primary point of contact regarding data protection issues for an organisation. They're also responsible for reporting to the board and should therefore have authority to report at this level. They need to have knowledge of data protection laws and will be independent of the organisation. Their role is to inform, advise and monitor compliance, as well as to provide advice on data protection impact assessments and cooperate with the supervisory authority. Even if your organisation doesn't need to formally appoint a DPO, you may choose to do so. Be careful um, not to give somebody the title of DPO if they don't actually fulfil the functions and meet the obligations of a DPO under GDPR. In such circumstances, you should use another title, such as a privacy officer. Data subjects have enhanced rights, which means that you need to have technical and organisational measures in place to be able to satisfy these. Some of the rights are already existing, such as the right to information, the right of access, and the right to rectification. There's also a new right of data portability to assist individuals to change service provider. This is not an absolute right, though, and only applies where the data subject has provided the personal data, the processing is based on consent or is necessary for the performance of a contract, and the processing is carried out by automated means. The right of erasure, otherwise known as the right to be forgotten, has attracted a publicity. Again, though, this is not an absolute right, and there are exemptions, for example, where retention is necessary for compliance with a legal obligation, or for exercising the rights of freedom or expression. Organisations, nevertheless, need to have measures in place to ensure that if the right is legitimately exercised, they can comply. So, as I mentioned at the start, one of the most significant changes introduced by the GDPR is that database processors have direct obligations for the first time. Whilst the Data Protection Act only imposes direct compliance obligations on controllers, with processors generally having contractual obligations which are passed down, we can see from the slide that data processors have a number of obligations, such as record keeping, security, breach notification, an obligation to have a DPO in if they meet the requirements, and an obligation to comply with the rules regarding transfers to said um, countries. Data subjects can also bring an action against a controller or processor, and they can face direct enforcement and penalties. Under the GDPR, controllers can only use processors, providing sufficient guarantees to implement appropriate technical and organisational measures so that the processing meets the requirements of GDPR and ensures the protection of the rights of data subjects. This is much broader than the current requirements and means that controllers will need to carry out a broader due diligence exercise when selecting a processor than they might currently undertake. This is going to require controllers digging deep into the realms of identifying the data flows of processors and their security measures. Whenever processing is carried out on behalf of a controller by a third party, i.e. a processor, those parties need to enter into a written contract which must contain a number of mandatory provisions, which I put up on the slide. Over the years, we've gradually seen the addition of clauses on a range of protections, from security breach notification to assistance with subject access requests. So to an extent, the GDPR provisions codify current best practice. However, the prescriptive nature of the GDPR means it's unlikely that even the most detailed of pre-GDPR clauses will completely satisfy the new requirements. One example of where GDPR goes further than current practice is in the case of subprocessing or subcontracting by the processor to a third party. GDPR prevents processors from subcontracting without prior written consent of the controller, which can be specific or general consent, and requires that where consent has been obtained, the processor informs the controller of any changes, and the subcontract must include the same rather than substantially similar data processing provisions as in the main contract. Now, this is going to pose difficulties for agreements for the provision of cloud-based solutions and, data, and for data processors who have long and dynamic supply chains. 
The new regulation has teeth, as can be seen by the tougher penalties for non-compliance. Currently in the UK, the maximum penalty for failing to comply with the Data Protection Act is £500,000. So as you can see from the slide, with the maximum penalties for non-compliance of €20 million Euros, or 4% of worldwide turnover, whichever the higher, these are truly tougher penalties. Also, where a business operates in more than one member state, it's currently unclear which member state will be responsible for administering any penalties. Despite the high fines, the ICO has been clear that it's not going to embark on a mission to hand down a huge fine for minor infringements from the 25th of May next year, and that its approach will be the same as it currently is, which is to guide, advise, and educate organisations about how to comply with the law, and this won't change under the GDPR. In their words, they've always preferred the carrot to the stick approach. And just to conclude, Despite the UK's impending exit of the EU, organisations must continue with their GDPR preparations. The government has now published the first draft of the Data Protection Bill, which will replace the Data Protection Act, and which also supplements the GDPR by, amongst other things, dealing with those matters in the GDPR left to member states' discretion. After Brexit, the bill will allow for continued application of GDPR standards and the GDPR will be incorporated into UK domestic law under the European Union Withdrawal Bill. It's therefore clear that the GDPR is set to remain. And that brings me to the end of my se uh, section, so I'm just going to hand over. Quick shuffle of chairs. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Max Pritchard, uh, pre-sales consultant with ActiveReach. I've got uh, 15 minutes to talk about uh, GDPR, particularly technology must-haves. Uh, now, I can't see or hear you, so I can't tell whether I've confused or lost anyone. Um, so before I begin, uh, I have to get something important out of the way. That's explicitly giving consent for people to use my email address. Uh, if you have a lengthier question that you can't pop in the chat for Sarah and I to answer at the end. So a bit about me, uh, so you know where I'm coming from. Uh, this is my normal presenting mode. You're going to have to imagine me waving my arms around. Uh, I'm a technical generalist by nature, an infrastructure guy by experience. I built my first network at university in 91 and uh, rather naively connected it to the internet and it's been a bit downhill ever since. After university, I've been involved in almost all aspects of networks for business, including security and compliance work. Now, I'm saying this to let you know what my bias is. Uh, GDPR leaves a huge amount of room for different technical responses um, and mine is only going to be one of many. So if I don't dwell on input validation in code development, for example, uh, it's for a reason. Now, the first thing I did uh, when I was asked to present on technology must-haves for GDPR was to read it, a revolutionary idea. Then I read several vendor commentaries. Uh, then I've been to several shows. I've talked to people about it. Last week, I woke up from a dream about GDPR. I have spent more time reading and thinking about this uh, than is strictly healthy. So this is how often common security technologies appear in the text. So my first observation. Notwithstanding numerous white papers from technology vendors, the law itself doesn't care much what technology you use. Most security technologies and specific threats to data are conspicuous by their absence in the text thus far. I can't comment on whether this will remain true in the future, but right now it's great because the law is tolerant to changes in technology best practice and the threat landscape. But it's also terrible because you have no idea where to start where to stop and what order to do things in. So let's go back and remind ourselves what the objectives of the GDPR are to try and understand what the law does care about. So Article 1 of the regulation is clear that this is, number one, about protecting the rights of natural persons, and number two, about maintaining free movement of personal data within the European Union. Now, I see two main and distinct areas where technology has a lot to play in meeting these objectives. So the first is making sure that data subjects can exercise their rights. This means providing easy management of consent, restriction of processing, access amendment challenge, or to have data deleted about them amongst other things. 
It also means recording diligently every transaction based on those. The second is protecting people's data when it's in an organization's care, security in a word. Now I'm going to take these two one at a time. The EU GDPR mandates a modern, cost-effective personal data management system. Now, I've got a little story from last week. I have over 258 online accounts with various organizations, and that is the tip of my immense personal data iceberg. Now, I tried to shrink my digital shadow recently. Very few of those 258 organizations made it easy for me to change my passwords or remove my account. A phone number to call might have even been nice. Now, even when I've apparently deleted an account, the data was obviously kept, given how often I still get emails from certain places. It took me days when it should have taken me considerably less than that. Now, some of those businesses have now lost my custom entirely based on purely how they handle my data. Blaming data subjects for poor account security is understandable, particularly if your password is 123456, but it is a kind of tragedy of the commons People are simply being overgrazed by organizations with a voracious appetite for information. It's no surprise we all lie online, and it's no surprise we're quite bad at passwords. Although GDPR's aspiration for data processing systems that serve mankind is lofty, giving people reasonable control over their own data has to be an opportunity for many organizations that claim to value customer experience and their reputation. That's whether the data subjects are their customers or their employees. GDPR could be an opportunity to win and retain custom and make employees feel valued and safe as much as it is a mad scramble to avoid a potential breach tax. Now, the GDPR also demands appropriate technical and organization measures to mitigate risk to the data subject. And it mentions four things specifically, encryption and pseudonymization, ensuring confidentiality, integrity, and availability, the CIA triad of security, the ability to restore availability and access to data in a timely manner, and processes for regularly testing the effectiveness of these measures. Organizations must take into account accidental or unlawful destruction, loss, alterization, uh, alteration, unauthorized disclosure of or access to personal data. It sets out rules for notification of security breaches to supervising authorities and in certain circumstances the data subjects. It's an enormously broad technical scope which covers all aspects of network security, high availability and redundancy systems, backup and restore and other areas. Where to begin? So the threat landscape is described in numerous regular reports by vendors and service providers and they all have different methods and focus. McAfee's report on dark web economics gives us a sense of scale as to what some obvious personally identifiable information is worth on the open market. So $20, for example, for a full record of identity information, or what we call fools, for example, um, which would make the Yahoo breach worth around $60 billion if that was true. Of course, the loss of that data may cost the data subject a whole lot more than it's worth to a criminal. Wedding photographs lost to hard drive failure, information about marital infidelity leaked to the press or your partner, corrupted or falsified financial data. The SANS threat landscape report and the Verizon DBIR are well worth reading for real data on cyber attacks. All the usual suspects are in here from cheap lucrative attacks like phishing and ransomware through to more complex and sophisticated exploits. GDPR is not just about data theft, it considers availability as well. The Azure cloud in Europe failed for several hours because of an accident involving fire suppression systems, and the National Lottery website was knocked offline by a DDoS attack. It could be you. It is worth noting that these attacks are not all directly threats to PII. The WannaCry ransomware was about money, but the effect on availability of information systems was widespread and the impact was felt by normal people. It might very well be that companies need to guess at how important the personal data they are holding is. What they don't really need to guess at is the most common ways they lose data. There's plenty of evidence there around. So the first thing we know, or the first thing you're taught as a security engineer, is that breaches are inevitable. 
just a few minutes spent thinking about numbers of devices, numbers of applications, lines of code, amount of configuration in the average computer network will tell you that we are reaching near biological levels of complexity. If that's the case, then the first thing to do is encrypt your data at rest, on the move, and during processing. Volume encryption, database encryption, email encryption, file encryption, VPNs. GDPR, GDPR knows how important it is. Equifax and innum innumerable other organizations have seemed to have forgotten. Encryption can be difficult. It isn't without its downsides, and it's not a panacea. The two main ways it can fail are because an attacker had the keys or credentials, or the encryption was not end-to-end. -end. Authentication, failure, weak default, reused, or stolen credentials are behind the majority of actual breaches. For all critical systems, for heaven's sake, use multi-factor authentication. I know it's annoying, but if you can log into your company's admin portal for your domain name or email system or customer database, then so can a crook. Don't give users admin rights to their own devices. Follow the principle of least privilege. Malware is getting difficult to stop. Endpoint protection with behavioral machine learning capable of dealing with polymorphic viruses, blended threats, and fileless script-based attacks are a safety net behind consistent patch management and managing risky user behavior. Email and web vectors are ubiquitous and they have to be a key focus for detailed policy and defense technology. Servers are the number one target for cyber attacks just ahead of client devices and then users. Good patch management scale to deal with the mean 20 days that you have between a vulnerability being published and then being exploited in the wild has to be backed up with web application firewalls, DDoS mitigation, bot management, traditional firewalls and the like. Now I could go on with a rather static risk-based technical response, threat by threat coming up with ways of solving them. But GDPR recognizes that company defenses need to be dynamic rather than static. The value of testing in order to demonstrate that your protections are effective, as well as improving configuration, process and performance cannot be overstated. Now it might be helpful to approach protection planning using a general model of data security to plan a comprehensive technical response. There are a number of cybersecurity models, but one popular one is the NIST cybersecurity framework. Now I'm just gonna expand on its core concepts a little bit and then use it as a structure for a final flyby of technology service areas that you may want to be considering. The first step to tackling the challenges is in identifying what personal data is in your business and where it is. Small businesses, small businesses may be able to audit this by hand, but it quickly scales beyond human comprehension without technological support. It absolutely has to become a constant process of search and discovery rather than a one-off snapshot. Data is not just account details, but can include phone calls, recorded for training and security purposes, emails sitting in inboxes, archives or backups, instant messages, logs and reports, test and development data, videos and images. Tools to find, tag and search for PII or the infrastructure where it dwells will be important and the larger the company, the more important it might be. It's not uncommon for entire sites and networks to disappear from a company's records. New serverless cloud offerings might add another order of magnitude of attack surface area. So before we start trying to defend our identified assets, we might want to consider reducing our systemic complexity. GDPR recognizes the benefits of data minimization and partial or full anonymization. Companies dodged PCI compliance costs by encrypting from card reader to payment service provider. The same might be attempted by GDPR by outsourcing consent management and pseudonymization services to a third party that specializes in GDPR compliance. Alongside minimization of data, simplification has security benefits on many levels. Code base, number of applications, operating environments, infrastructure, and third party numbers can be reduced. Physically separating your operational systems from your communication systems might neatly bypass many security challenges. At the other end of the complexity spectrum, machine learning has enormous potential to solve seemingly intractable security problems 
but can also cock it up in uniquely opaque ways. All I can suggest is to spend your complexity coins wisely. Elegance is a friend of security and compliance. Security products and services are where many people think I'll begin a presentation like this, but it's coincidentally quite close to the end of my talk. There should be nothing new here for people in IT or security. However, risk calculations may change based on the increase in maximum fines available to the regulators. This list is nowhere near comprehensive. I've not touched on disposal of storage media, USB keys, Internet of Things, or innovative ways of exfiltrating data from air gap networks, among many others. One thing I will emphasize is the role of testing your technical measures, <clears throat> not just to improve them so they can tackle the state of the art in attacks and issues, but also to provide a crucial audit trail of evidence that you took care. Buying into protections is all very well, but you will look just as foolish and possibly out of pocket if you haven't tested to see if it works as you expected, and then you get hit. We're on the home straight now. How do you know when you've been breached? The number one reported detection method are your users reporting something funny going on. Security awareness training is more than just slapping people who click on links in email. People are smart and can be encouraged to be an excellent detection method. Respect contact with security researchers, law enforcement and public because your data might be found in the wild after raids and botnet take sounds. Now there are technology ranges of tools to detect anomalies and collate data from across a business and even products that create fake infrastructure honeypots to trap advanced persistent threat actors as they crab walk across an internal network. This data will be crucial to fulfill your notification responsibilities to your authorities and the data subjects. I note that if you have encrypted your data, your obligation to contact the data subjects may well be reduced, which is nice. And there's, then there's your actual response, which is probably more about process design and education and, again, testing than it is about technology per se. Last but not least, the recovery phase. The number of companies that do regular backups of critical data is greater than the number who actively practice restoring that data from backup. Some systems that are crucial for availability, such as Active Directory, have notoriously complicated backup and restore processes that are tricky to automate, and it is, regardless of what people might think, a security problem. So, so is where and how you store your encrypted backups and archives. You did encrypt those as well, didn't you? So, we made it. Well done, all of you are still with me, and I'm gonna leave you with a few thoughts. Firstly, GDPR is an opportunity to improve life for people whose data you have by demonstrating that you would respect their rights. Why not do it for all of your users and employees, regardless of EU status? Secondly, for security teams, GDPR represents nothing more than an evolution. It's a chance to reevaluate security tools and posture, perhaps with more emphasis on testing and innovation. And if we're honest with ourselves, we could all do a bit better in keeping data secure. No more products left on shelves or running with default settings. And thirdly, encrypts everything. Thanks very much for listening. Thank you, Max and Sarah. Uh, we're now going to begin answering the questions submitted during today's presentation. Uh, so thank you very much for sending those in. We've received some via email and some through the, uh, the questions panel. Um, you can still submit questions through the questions pane in your attendee control panel if you haven't done so yet. Uh, we've got 15 minutes, so we will do our best to answer as many questions as we can during the session. If not, we will follow up with you individually after today. So our first question is, uh, do we have anywhere a list of IT requirements interpreting Article 32? Um, Max, I'll pass that one over to you. That's lovely. Article 32 is one of my favorites. Um, that's the one that talks about um, having te technical measures that um, are state of the art or take due regard for the state of the art um, and are proportionate and cost effective to the risks being run uh, by data subjects. Um, is there a list of IT requirements? 
Well, no, there isn't. Um, currently, GDPR text does not contain lists of technology. It doesn't address uh, any of the technology uh, search terms that I put in. So it doesn't mention firewalls, IPS, IDS. Um, it mentions encryption three times, and it mentions pseudonymization six times. Um, you can take those as uh, suggestions from GDPR about what technologies to be employing. But it um, absolutely doesn't provide um, a list of technologies to be investing in. So demonstration that your security is proportionate to the risk being run from your data subjects is very much open to interpretation, which is why I told people what my bias would be looking at infrastructure first. Um, but every vendor you talk to, every security professional, um, every sales team is going to have a particular view on what technologies are crucial. Um, but ultimately, given evidence of the kind of companies that lose data and the kind of volume that they lose it in, um, the IT requirements have to be, uh, the security requirements have to be um, starting from or predicated on your breaches going to happen. What are you going to do to stop that data risk being realized for the data subject? Great, thank you, Max. Uh, is encryption a must? How easy is it to upgrade an existing system with pseudo anonymization concept? Pass that one over to you, Max. <laughs> <laughs> is encryption a must? In, well, n although GDPR specifically mentions encryption, and it is one of the few technologies it bothers to mention, um, and it is important from the point of view that it's one of the first questions that businesses will be asked if they have had a breach. Um, i.e., was the data encrypted? Because if it is, um, then the criminals may well not be able to exercise um, any value out of that, and of course, the data subject is continued to be protected. Um, so, is it essential? Yes, I would say it is at this stage. Now, how comprehensively you encrypt is open to debate. Um, I see there is a question a bit later about. Um, encryption's impact on performance um, and it is true that encryption systems depending on the level that they're employed um, will have um, functional uh, difficulties and functional challenges you know how much CPU power you've got how hard you encrypt it um, that is going to make it difficult to be comprehensive uh, encryption but where it is possible to encrypt it either at a, a volume level to protect your drives or an application level to protect your databases or even just at a file level to protect crucial information held in sort of relatively unstructured format, it really ought to be employed first. It should be the number one thing that you have considered um, and you document your considerations to make sure you've proved um, that you have balanced cost effectiveness with functional challenges. Um, because the security benefits, um, assuming a breach will happen, are phenomenal. Um, and how easy is it to upgrade a system with pseudonymization? Well, pseudonymization technologies at the moment are relatively niche, as is consent management coming from healthcare sectors. Um, what I've seen is a new wave of um, cloud-based um, consent management companies that are appearing um, much in the same way that companies like PayPal um, provide um, payment services and can integrate cleanly in inverted commas with people's web applications, I would imagine that there will be a, um, a raft of companies that are going to be meeting that capability, either built into applications themselves or offered as a service that can plug into web infrastructure, for example. Right, so would I recommend encrypting postcodes at rest? And it makes it hard to search for clients. Um, well, postcodes are um, not individually identifiable, but when they're combined with a name or a house number, then they will be, so they're relatively pseudonymized. You could encrypt the rest of the record, leaving the postcodes unencrypted. Um, and uh, allowing you to search on postcodes um, if the application has that degree of granular control over how much of the record to um, 
encrypt. Otherwise, that could well be a challenge, but it's hard to tell whether if you have a breach um, and you haven't encrypted your data because it was difficult to do so and maintain the functioning of your business, whether the ICO or any other um, authority is going to take a dim view of um, not being able to overcome those challenges, um, I'm afraid I can't tell you. Okay. Uh, another question coming in. Uh, each company has to have a data protection officer, uh, but they shouldn't work for the company, uh, but they should have board level access. Is that right? I'll pass that one to you, Sarah. Um, well, I guess just to start with, just to say that not every company has to have a data protection officer. So it will only be if if you're a public authority or if your core activities re require that regular and systematic monitoring of data subjects on a large scale or the processing of the large scale processing of sensitive personal data as well. So that kind of deals with, with that part. Um, they can work for the company. Um, they can be internal or they can be external. The thing to just bear in mind with an internal appointment is that the DPO has to be independent and mustn't have a conflict of interest. So whilst somebody acting as a DPO can have other duties and other tasks, those duties can't conflict with their duties as a DPO. Now the DPO shouldn't be determining the means and the purpose of processing. And the Article 29 Working Party has produced some guidance on a DPO, who should be a DPO, um, and it specifically sort of called out a few, a few titles and suggested that as a rule of thumb, they would have a conflict of interest. So senior management roles, CFO, COO, COO, head of IT, head of marketing, head of HR. Um, I can probably hear a few of you um, breathing a sigh of relief if you hold one of those roles that you can't actually be a DPO. Um, so, so yes, so it could be internal or external. Thank you. Uh, regarding the right to be forgotten, how does a company prove that a data subject's data has been deleted without then keeping a record of the subject and the data deletion? Is anonymization enough? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Um, you have to keep a record of the transaction and presumably if you could submit some kind of deletion code to the um, data subject, um, if they then reference that deletion code, you could then look up that deletion code alongside the record of the deletion, um, thereby anonymizing the data. Um, I, I, I honestly don't know, I'm afraid I can't answer that question. Okay, let's move on. We've got time for just a, a few more. Uh, regarding the right to be forgotten, will the organization need to delete information from backups? If yes, is this applicable retrospectively or only backups from the 25th of May 2018? I mean, all any if somebody exercises their right to be forgotten, they exercise their right to be forgotten, and so you need to delete the information. Um, if is this applicable retrospectively? Um, yes, it doesn't. You know, the GDPR, as from the 25th of May 2018, whatever records and whatever data you're holding, the GDPR will will apply to that. So it doesn't say no, you, you were holding that pre 25th of May, so you don't need to comply. It, it, it will cover everything that you that you hold. Okay, great. Um, just going through uh, some questions we've received by email as well. Um, we have a database of about 40,000 email addresses. Do we now have to contact each of these email recipients and ask if they are still happy for us to have their data? Or do we have to delete and start from scratch with our email database? Yeah, I think this is a, um, a problem that um, probably the majority of organizations in this country is happening at the, having at the moment. You know, and like I, you know, going back to the point I just made about the fact that it will apply to data that you already hold, so it does apply retrospectively. You know, what are you going to do with those large databases? And as I mentioned at the beginning of my, um, my session, I said that you have to have a lawful basis for processing your, the personal data. So I think the first thing that you need to do in terms of that database you need to understand what you're using that data for. What are the purposes, you know, um, 
as to why you're holding that data. And then you need to identify the lawful basis for doing so. Now, if you're, if you're saying, I don't know what this database is for, but if it's, say, a marketing database, um, the, the GDPR recognizes that um, direct marketing can be carried out. You know, you can use the legitimate interest basis to carry out direct marketing. All I would say is that you just need to bear in mind, if you're doing marketing, that there's existing rules regarding direct marketing. So you have the e-privacy regulations, and you, they run alongside data protection. So you have to comply with both. You have to ensure that you have a legal basis for processing that data in the first place. And then if you're sending email communications, for example, you need to make sure that in doing so, you're complying with the e-privacy regulations. Now, that may well mean that you do have to get consent. There are soft opt-in options under e-privacy. Um, just to complicate things even further, e-privacy regulations are going through a change as well. So it, it is a very gray area. Um, if you're relying on consent, though, to send people um, information, you will need to ensure that from the 25th of May, that consent meets the um, more onerous um, requirement for consent under GDPR. So you need to make sure that it's that freely given, specific, informed, and unambiguous consent. So no opt-outs, no silence, or anything like that. So you may well need to embark on a, um, a repermissioning project before the 25th of May. Uh, thank you, everybody, and apologies that we haven't actually been able to answer all of your questions individually, but uh, we will get back to you uh, and respond to you uh, on an individual basis. Um, I just wanted to, to thank Sarah and Max, and thank everyone for attending today's webinar. Uh, if you have any other questions, you can contact Max via email on max.pritchard at activereach.net. Uh, alternatively, if you would like to speak to him regarding GDPR-specific technologies, we can arrange a one-to-one -one consultation. Uh, and once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a short survey, and we would appreciate it if you could complete that and provide your feedback. Uh, you will also receive a follow-up email within the next few days with a link to view a recording of today's webinar as well as a copy of our GDPR guide for IT and security professionals. So on behalf of Active Reach, Boyce Turner, and our speakers, thank you for joining us today, and have a great rest of your day. Bye-bye.